Gotcha. So we've got budget, identifying and sticking with a budget yep. and being consistent with it. Yep. We've got our demographic. Who are we targeting? What's our ideal customer look like? Yep. What else? What else do we got here, Matt? The next thing I, I think about for folks is your site, right? Your site is your, it's a thing that you can spend a lot of money on. You can do yourself or you can spend a little bit of money on it. It's kind of up to you, but the site starts to tell your story, right? When you're starting to construct a narrative of who you are and the kinds of things that you're about, you've got to get good at telling your own story, right? Alan has started and grown several multi-million dollar businesses. His mission is to help you do the same. Welcome to the Business Growth Pod, building the future one entrepreneur at a time. Hey everyone, welcome to the show. I'm Alan. I'm a family man, an attorney, and an entrepreneur. Each week, we provide resources and advice to help build your business. Are you ready? Then let's go. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Business Growth Pod. I'm your host, Alan Draper, excited for another episode. We're going to be talking about all things marketing today. So you're going to want to stay tuned. Listen to the entire episode. You're going to be able to grab some nuggets that will definitely help your business no matter what industry you're in. I'm just going to get right into it. Our guest today is Matt Rogers. Matt is actually one of my business partners and he operates, runs the show for Lizard SEM, which is a digital marketing agency. We do all sorts of marketing. We do paid media, we do SEO, we build websites, we do social media, we do we create content, we write blog articles, all sorts of things. And Matt is in charge of everything at Lizard and has done just an incredible job growing that company, which is still less than a year old. So I wanted to bring him on and get into his brain a little bit about how we can help startups grow. So welcome to the show, Matt. Thank you. It's an honor to have you here today, buddy. Thank you so much. Let's talk a little bit about your career. You started as a designer and then you got into the pest control business because of your family and you stuck with the marketing side of pest control for quite some time. So tell us a little bit about that and a little bit about your passion and what drew you to marketing. So the the gateway for me was graphic design. That's my undergrad, right? And in terms of like the infrastructure of the marketing world, graphic designers make things pretty, right? And so that's what we do. It's kind of like the paint in the room, right? It's not the structure itself. It's just the thing that makes things look pretty. You can create some compelling messages that resonate with the consumer or somebody that you're trying to talk to, and that's incredible. But the largest chunk of work for graphic designers is to just take something that's abstract and to make it look beautiful and functional. So I love that. I kind of stumbled upon it in college and I, I fell in love with the process. I loved talking to or learning about history through the, like the lens of, of art. And then I loved the idea of being able to communicate with people visually, right? And so that was my undergrad. And it was my dad and my stepmom would say they had to wrangle me pretty hardcore to get me to come into the family business. It was their 10th <laughs> request that finally got me interested. But I, I entered at kind of like a, a, like a lower, I was a, an assistant, but I promised to grow in the ranks and one day inherit the company and all this kind of stuff. It was like drinking from the fire hydrant of marketing because Killingsworth had a deep commitment to the the function of marketing, the importance of marketing to grow your company. And so I was having aspects to everything, not just graphic design, but I was executive producing commercials and designing billboards and making trifolds and designing truck wraps and putting QR codes on vehicles and working with SEO and working with PPC and redesigning the website and then redesigning it again and cross-selling marketing to our current customer database. And it was just, it was wild, man. I'd never learned so much as I did in the six years between when I jumped on to the time that they ended up uh, selling their company. But it, it was a wonderful experience because I got to work with a really amazing marketing company in Charlotte, North Carolina, Pigney Marketing. Shout out Mike Pigney through that and the connections that I was making with television, with over the top television, with digital marketing, outdoor advertising, I learned so, so much. So I'm grateful for the opportunity to kind of bring that to 
folks that are just kind of starting out and trying to figure out what they need to do to get their business going. You know, marketing is like the catalyst to do that, but there's a lot of ambiguity sometimes around that. So I love that. Tell me about where Killingsworth was when you came on board and what it ultimately became. Yeah. So when, when I got on board, my parents had grown the company to, it was a little north of $8 million in gross revenue. And uh, by the time we sold, uh, we were well into the 20s. <laughs> and that was six years later. And this was all through the, a couple of functions. One exclusively being a, like a commitment, a fiscal commitment. It was a percentage on our P&L that went to marketing every month, no matter what. And two, cross-selling to clients that already loved us, right? We had such a huge database. I think we're at, 30, if I'm, I'm a little removed now, but I think we're at 34,000 customers or something like that. And some of them had some services and others had other services, but they all loved us. So the ability to kind of talk to them about other services we provide, they're like, yeah, why would I trust Joe Schmo lawn guy from Craigslist at the time when I could go with a company that I already love and just consolidate my billing? So most of the, our growth came from those two functions, right? A commitment to digital marketing by way of a percentage and then cross-selling to our, our current customer database as our database was continuing to grow. I've heard it said quite frequently that marketing is like the black hole of a business. Yeah. Why is that? What is it that makes marketing kind of a little bit of a wild card and and unknown? Yeah. And what can, especially startup entrepreneurs, people that are just getting rolling, what can they do to kind of hedge their bets a little bit and make sure that they're hitting on things that will actually produce an ROI? Well, I think that it's a black hole to people because the landscape of marketing continues to change, right? It, like, and it's the even even in these last two years in this pandemic, the construct of marketing, the vehicles that people are using to tell messages, branding messages, hey, you should think about the service messages, or hey, buy this messages. It's all it's changing. It's changing quickly, and so it's really intimidating, I think, to a lot of people who are not as invested in it so consistently, right? thinking about marketing constantly. How are people communicating? Is there a better way to communicate? Are there other vehicles that can be used to do a better job than the ones that we're doing right now? Can we pick this marketing infrastructure up and move it down the line, try something else? A lot of the fluidity and the fast pace of marketing, I think that that intimidates a lot of business owners. I think what made Killings Earth a little different in that regard is my parents both worked in the yellow pages back in the day, both of them. Mm. And that's like, that. It, that was marketing. That was Google before Google, right? And so they were already familiar because of their client relationships that they had of what marketing does to businesses that are growing and how important it is to constantly be bringing new blood into the front of your business, whether you're selling a product and your e-commerce, selling new products, right? And if you're a service industry, retaining, not just bringing new blood in, but also retaining clients that you have through amazing service, right? As you have these two things like working in tandem, your business just gets more and more and more and you can do more and more and you can spend more and, and you're talking to more people. I, I think it intimidates people to answer your, your first question. It intimidates me sometimes, quite frankly, because it, the, the landscape changes so much. But I, I think the, the thing that someone really needs to kind of start the process with, even in working with you at Lizard, the thing that I'm talking to people about the most, I just got off the phone with a gentleman uh, out of Utah uh, before I jumped on this call. The thing that I try to talk to people about the most is no matter what your commitment is, no matter how much you are deciding to commit to marketing, no matter if it's me, no matter if it's anybody, you need to find out what that percentage is. And you need to think of it like a savings account. You need to invest and you need to keep investing and allow it to bring more people into the front door or sell more product or have a better website that's ranking higher or cut that new commercial or, you know, put that billboard out there on, on the, on the interstate or whatever. So the first thing for me, when I'm talking to a new person, I've talked to small companies that are, that are like really, really small, like uh, two, two employee companies. And then I've talked to people that have 50, 60 employees. And then I've talked to people that have several, you know, hundred employees, right? The commitment needs to be agreed upon before you start the process and you need to commit to it for a while. That's always my, my first kind of thing that we talk about. Yeah. I think kind of talking about the budget and talking about the consistency What I've learned over the years, and I didn't start off with this experience or knowledge or thought process, but a lot of things in business are directly correlated with consistency. Business success is not found from doing one thing exceptionally well, doing one thing exceptionally well one time. Right. 
a lot of people th- like think that, you know, they want to be an overnight success. No such thing. Overnight successes, if you dig, are always 10 years in the making. Yeah. 15 years in the making, right? For sure. Now they get recognition, what seems like almost overnight. Yep. But you, you've got to understand the backstory. And I think marketing is one of those key pieces, Matt, where it's don't expect when you start a business and you start a marketing program, don't expect miracles the next day or the next week or the next month. It's a grind. Both of those things. That's why I love marketing. It's, it's all a grind. It's so parallel to business success. So do you find that a lot with, with startup entrepreneurs that are like, hey, I want it right now or any business owner yeah. that like they think it's going to be a light switch and the day you start marketing, everything's going to change. Is, is that kind of been your experience? For sure. Before I was even in graphic design, when a while I was in graphic design, this is 2008. So the recession, right? When it was hard for a graphic designer to get some work, I actually became a teacher for a little while. And I learned when I was getting my education degree, a statistic that like really stuck with me this whole, whole time it has to do with marketing, has to do with branding, has to do with teaching, right? It was a study that came out of Harvard and it talked about the need for someone to ingest a message 27 times for 73% retention, right? Hmm. Meaning I have to, I have to, let's think of brands, right? I have to have uh, consumed a brand message or a product message X amount of times for it to resonate in my memory so that when I do need that service or when I am thinking about that product, I think about this particular brand, right? And what that means for me in terms of marketing is it is a grind. The first, the first message is hard. The second message gets a little bit easier to get that out there in front of a consumer. Third message, fourth message, fifth message, and so on, right? Let's get to the 27 so that when somebody ha- is having a problem with their house or when somebody is thinking of the sneakers that they wanted to buy mm. or when somebody is thinking about uh, a car that they saw that advertisement for and they're, they're thinking about making that pers- purchase – that message has resonated in their mind. They've retained it somewhere around 70%. I don't know the smart Harvard people came up with that number, but it always stuck with me, right? Staying with it, being consistent and staying with the grind of marketing is a part of getting into the psyche of the people that you're trying to talk to. And you can't sell a product or a service without being inside of and at the top of their mind when that person is ready to make a buying decision. And so your commitment is, is congruent with staying in front of them. It's important to stay in front of the consumer as often as you can, however you can. That's why having good social media presence is important. That's why having good content for Google to grab is important. That's why paid advertising is so important. That's why the wrapping your vehicle is so important. That's why putting a a post up on Instagram for e-commerce with a frequency cap of like 12, I, I get the same ad for uh, this company called 10,000. I ended up buying a lot of stuff for them. Kudos to 10,000. <laughs> I just I had a package come in and my wife's like, really, you needed this? But I bought uh, some some of their, uh, they have these dope uh, hit interval training shorts and shirts that are like wicking away sweat, they say, and doing all this kind of stuff. But I, did, I didn't read any of that stuff. They were just there when I thought, you know, I'm looking pretty rough in the same stuff I've been hitting the gym with in the past six months. I need to, I need to, I need to update. And oh yeah, 10,000. They've only shown me 12 ads in the last one month, you know? Yeah. That's, it's funny because it sounds like you've retained about 73% of their brand messaging. (laughs) They're the first person I thought of and and I'm wearing their shorts right now and I love them. (laughs) Yeah. So you, you mentioned budget, right? For, for new companies. Yeah. What, in addition to creating a budget and sticking to a budget, do you recommend in order for new companies to get traction through marketing? I think the second piece of the puzzle is you really do need to sit down and think about who is your audience, right? Who is your audience? Because if you've got this budget that you're going to spend on trying to talk to these folks, the last thing that you want to do at the early and precious stages of starting a company is spend money that's hard to come by talking to people that you don't want to talk to, that are not ready to make a, a buying decision with you and your company, that are not, are not willing to get into a contract, are not willing to buy that product, or are not willing to get in, involved in that service, right? I think the second piece of the puzzle after you decide, this is my commitment, and it's going to be an ongoing part of commitment, no matter if I could be here, I could be there, I could be whatever, but my commitment to marketing is this percentage of my, my revenue. The next piece of the puzzle for me, when I think about it, is who do I want to talk to and how do I talk to them? I think that there's a lot of a lot of learning and a lot of understanding you got to do before you even start putting a message out there, you know? Yeah. You know, I was just talking to somebody and we were talking about why it's important 
for a startup to have a niche, yep. have a demographic. And it's really common for, you know, I own a law firm and it's really common for a new business, a law firm, for example, to say, you know, someone will ask, hey, you know, what do you do? What areas of law do you practice? And they're like, oh, we do it all. Yeah. I commonly say, if you do it all in an industry, you don't really do anything. He's exactly right. And so you have to have that niche. You have to have that avatar, that perfect demographic, and you have to be able to identify it. What do, what does your demographic, first of all, what problem do you solve? Yeah. Right. Make sure that's clear in the brand messaging, but what, what does your demographic buy? What does your demographic do for a hobby? What does your dem- demographic do on the weekends? What does your demographic do for work? Where do they live? What kind of car do they drive? Yeah. And the more precise that you can get that demographic in your mind and identify it, I think the better you are to market, able to market to them, right? Absolutely. How does your target audience consume? How are they doing that? Where are they getting the things that they're interested in? And where are they talking about getting those things, right? So take, take these shorts that I'm wearing right now. <laughs> I, bought, I spent way too much money on them. I like, it's it's brilliant, okay? And this is a perfect example of knowing who your audience is so you can serve them some of these precious ad dollars that you have. I follow some fitness groups, some people that, especially during the pandemic, they give you insight on things you can do at home to stay fit, right? I mean, there's some, in, in Charlotte, where I'm from, there's these workout communities where everybody kind of gets together and they go out into the parks and they work out and they take selfies and it's great. And, I, and I have, I'm in a couple of those groups too. And so this company where I bought my shorts from, I'm not going to give them any more shout outs on this uh, podcast, <laughs> <laughs> but they know that I follow these places because they know who they're trying to talk to, right? They know that I'm rolling around and at Freedom Park from time to time in Charlotte, North Carolina. And hey, I'm, I may need some new shorts, you know? And so they know Matt Rogers follows this guy, this guy, this trainer, and is a part of these two groups. And this seems like a good pl- place where we should serve an ad. And they served me 12 ads and then I bought some product, right? So hmm. knowing who your audience is, and knowing how to find and, and deliver it to them, either a product message, a service message, a compelling brand message, those are the two biggest things for me. Well, well before you start talking about how to spend your money, knowing how much you want to spend, and knowing who you want to talk to. Gotcha. So we've got budget, identifying and sticking with a budget, yep. and being consistent with it. Yep. We've got our demographic. Who are we targeting? What's our ideal customer look like? Yep. What else? What else do we got here, Matt? The next thing I I think about for folks is your site, right? Your site is your, it's a thing that you can spend a lot of money on. You could do yourself or you could spend a little bit of money on. It's kind of up to you, but the site starts to tell your story, right? When you're starting to construct a narrative of who you are and the kinds of things that you're about, you've got to get good at telling your own story, right? And your site's kind of the place where you kind of launch off. It's where a lot of your social media is going to be integrated back into. It's where you're going to try to climb in terms of rankings with Google, if you're doing any paid search or paid social, it's going to link back to that as well. It's going to be where kind of the hub of most of your marketing. So having a site that is is good and concise and communicates well is kind of the next the next thing I begin to think about when I'm thinking about representing whatever the message is that I'm trying to convey. Does that make sense? Yeah. No. Hundred percent. Do you recommend that startups, let's say on a limited budget, that they try to build a website themselves or What's the thought process that they should go through in determining what their budget should be for a website and who they should get to help them, especially when they're they're on a limited budget yeah. and they're just trying to get something off the ground? You've really got to do some self-analysis, right? If you first agreed on what your budget is and your commitment to that is, the second thing you've decided is who you're going to talk to. And then the third thing you decided is I need to make sure people know who I am so I can start to tell my story. Right, over and over and over. That's so much of growing your business is telling your story over and over and over and over and over more than 27 times for 70% retention. Right? Once you've kind of made those decisions, you've got to consider using part of that budget and your circumstance to determine how you want to kind of approach this. Right? If you are the type of business owner, most of the business owners that I talk to that are in the field and doing the things, right? they do not have the time and possibly not the experience to do a website the way that it should be done. Right? to kind of develop that, that project, to, to make sure you've got all the alt tags, to, to make sure that the sitemap is where it's supposed to be, to make sure that the Google's crawl on the sitemap, to make sure all these things, right? If you don't have the bandwidth, you need to consider making an investment in outsourcing that. 
if you are some weirdo like me or have maybe just uh, like someone else, you know, like maybe David Gilmer, uh, you just know random stuff, right? And you could do something like this on free time that maybe you're having to contrive at the cost of your family, or maybe that you're just squirreling away and you've got some time to build it, then yeah, go for it. Or somebody like me who's got the background kind of knowledge and training to do something like that, then, then go for it. So it's, it's a little, for, for me, that piece is like circumstantial, right? Most of the people that I talk to and the people that I market for, they do not have time or the capacity to start a project like that and to do it well. And so those are, that's kind of my, it's that fork in the road for me. Yeah. So I recently shared on a podcast, my thoughts about when to decide, especially as a business owner, when to decide if the task in front of you should be delegated or handled by yourself. Yeah. And it really comes down to a couple of questions. Number one, what's my budget? slash resources, right? I'm going to throw time in there also because that's a really big part. That's a resource. That's your best resource. Exactly. That's your greatest resource, yeah. the one that you're you're never going to get more of. Yep. So what what are my resources to get this task done? Two, what's my interest level in me doing it myself? Like, hey, if I, maybe I own an auto dealership, but I've always wanted to kind of get my hands on the the, the marketing, building a website, for future use or whatever, just, just personally. And one time years ago, I couldn't get my lawnmower to start. And I realized there was an issue getting gas to the engine or whatever. I'm not a super like mechanical guy. Same. And I was sitting there looking at it and I'm like, should I solve this problem myself or should I hire somebody? I definitely had the financial means to have somebody else take care of it. But a couple of things came to my mind. Number one, and this is one of my positive affirmations that I tell myself every morning, and that is that I am able to learn how to do anything. And so because of that, and because I was genuinely curious, I rebuilt the carburetor. It took a lot. It took me probably four or five times the amount of time that it would have taken a skilled mechanic to to do, to be able to accomplish that in. But I wanted to learn how to do it, and I wanted to prove my, to myself that I could do it. The problem was it took me four hours or whatever. Yeah. And so at the end, I'm like, okay, I'm glad I did it. I'm glad I proved to myself that I could do it. I'm never, I'm never do doing again. that again. <laughs> I'm not doing that again. Yeah. So I think, you know, that's, that's the second part of this analysis. Hey, is, is there something in this where I need to learn something or I need to prove something to myself or I'm genuinely interested? Yeah. And if the answer to the first question, what are my resources? is something like, well, I have sufficient resources to pay somebody else to do it. And the answer to the second question is, no, I'm not super interested. I just, I really need to focus my, my efforts on building my company, which is, should be the answer for 99% of people yeah. on these types of tasks. Then it's like, okay, I'm going to pay somebody to do this, right? Yes. Because that person is going to be able to do a better job and not take up the amount of time that I would have to take if I were to build it. And I, I obviously, I do a lot of marketing in the service industry, right? So when people are starting out in the service industry and they're building these small companies, they're part of the labor force also, right? So these people have even less time to sit down and to think through and develop something like this. Well, and one of the greatest conundrums or one of the greatest questions that faces an entrepreneur is how should I spend my time? And in his book, Good to Great, Jim Collins talks about this and he talks about it from the point of from the point of view of the actual company, and he calls it the hedgehog concept. I think you can apply this to an individual, to a business leader or a business owner. And he says that businesses should focus on the intersection of three things. What drives the company's economic engine? What are they deeply passionate about? And what can they be the best in the world at? Yeah. And the intersection of that is what he, he dubs the hedgehog concept and says, that's what the company should do. And everything besides that, the company should ignore. So they're not distracted by this next shiny object. As an individual is going through this process of, hey, how much of this marketing, not just building a website, but how much of this marketing should I put on somebody else's shoulders? Should I hire somebody to do? I think that analysis should be in there. Yeah. Is that something that you can be the best in the world at? Probably not. Is that something that is driving your company's economic engine? 
unless you're a marketing company or a design company, the answer is no. Right. And in that case, you wouldn't be hiring anybody anyway. You would be doing it yourself. That's right. And is it something that you're deeply passionate about? Yeah. So nine times out of 10, maybe even 99 out of 100, they're going to want to hire somebody. How do they find somebody that they can trust in both building a website and just digital marketing generally? What are what are the steps they should take or what's the best way for them to identify a company that will actually help them meet their goals and provide a service that is commensurate with the cost of what yeah. they're doing? I'm not exactly sure if this is the right answer. It's the answer that I, I think of a lot now, right? And that is, I think it's really important when you're doing your due diligence to figure out who you're going to be marketing with to spend time, not hurried time, because this is a, it's a commitment. It's a part of your revenue stream that you're making a commitment to and a partnership that you're trying to make that hopefully lasts a while. So you're not having to start all over and over and over because if, if there's one thing that is consistent about digital marketing is starting all over takes more time, right? So you don't want to be in a, in a feedback loop of starting over constantly, right? Take time at the beginning and talk to the people that you are trying to do your business with, right? And get a sense of who this person is. Do they know their stuff? Do they give me a sense that they understand me and my business, right? And let that be kind of your, your guiding light as to whether or not you need to kind of get involved with these people. If you feel like a number, if you feel like you are, are one of many, if you feel like you can be bypassed and that this thing, because starting a business is, is tender, man. It's tender and all dollars are precious when you start in a business, right? The last thing that you want to do is start the process with somebody who makes you feel like they've got to get to the next call, right? That may not be the right answer, but that's my answer right now, especially when I'm talking, I mean, I'm passionate about startups anyway, because of my family history, right? And so I feel that a lot when I'm talking to people, they feel like a number, they feel bypassed, they feel run through, they feel like their phone calls are getting dodged, whatever. I think that that's the most important part. Take your time in making your decision and make the decision based on conversations that you're having with this folk and how to make you feel by the time you're done having the conversation. Yeah, makes sense. Well, as we're wrapping up here, Matt, you know, what other just general recommendations do you have for startups when it comes to marketing? What mistakes are you seeing them make? What are kind of your concluding thoughts as you're, you know, we're wanting to, to get the most expertise out of your brain as possible? Yeah. If you're working with somebody who's truly working with you, right, and is committed to making your company grow and doing all the things that they know how to do, you need to give it a little bit of time at the beginning. We talk about that a lot. You and I talk about that a lot. I think it's it's very critical, right? When you are starting a digital marketing process, whether that's Google, whether that's uh, e-com, uh, whether that's marketing through social media, you are starting the process of teaching the marketing company that you're working with, this person that you've decided on step one that you want to talk to, right? And you are starting the process of teaching this marketing company that you've decided to work with who you're not trying to talk to. And that takes a little time. And you need to be willing to work with this company as, as they get better and better at doing work for you. And so I think a commitment, not just fiscally, once you decide what your, your percentage is that you're giving to them, but also a commitment of time. And it could be something that you're not even discussing with this person. Maybe you think, okay, if we don't make any progress after X, then I need to start having conversations about Y, right? But a commitment of time and sticking with something, just like making your business growing, making your business grow, making a good marketing relationship takes time to grow and you've got to give, you've got to give it time. Love it. That's, I mean, that's very wise advice in more ways than one. Where can somebody go, Matt, to learn more about Lizard SEM, all the great things you're doing there or can, or connect with you? Yeah. Yeah. If you are looking for somebody to partner with you for marketing, just go to lizardsem.com, scroll all the way down to the bottom. There's a place to fill out a little uh, appointment to chat over the phone. I'll set up a, a link between the two of us and we can just talk shop, can teach me about your business talk to me about some of your struggles and see if this is the right partnership for you or us, you know, but yeah, lizardsem.com and just scroll to the bottom. Love it. Thanks for your time today, Matt. I uh, wish you yeah. nothing but success in the future. And I'm, I'm looking Thank forward you. to the uh, journey that Lizard SEM is on and the way that we can help everybody. Appreciate it, man. Absolutely. Thanks, buddy. If you've enjoyed today's podcast, please leave us a rating. And for daily inspiration and business tips, follow Alan on Instagram. 
Until next time, remember, we build the future one entrepreneur at a time. <laughs>